good morning. Very pleased to come and talk to you all. I'm going to follow on from Innes's talk. Um, I work in Broomfield, which is in Chelmsford. We've had the uh, fortune to have the money to buy a Pulma Vista, which is a, the only current market of a, a marketable device which shows EIT measurement. And I'm going to hopefully describe how we, as working jobbing clinicians, use this technology. And I am a big fan. So we bought this piece of equipment, and as you can see, I've put up how we've used it. We didn't set out with any great goals. I'd seen this machine many years ago um, and was blown away by the images that you get from it and how it fundamentally changes how you think about ventilation. But we introduced it. We set no protocol. Um, we have, basically, it's down to the intensive care consultant to choose when you use it. But in essence, if you have a patient that has high FI2, um, non-compliant lungs, you think that the tidal volumes are adequate, so if you go on your global measures of six to eight mils per kilo, lean body weight, but you're still getting high CO2s, that might be the patient you want to use this technology in. So emergency cases, it's not for your standard patient that comes in post theater. You're not gonna really need that, um, this technology there, but for the emergency cases, people with respiratory failure, this is where it, um, I think, makes a difference to how you ventilate people. So I'm going to present to you three cases, and on the right I'm going to show you some dynamic images from these patients. So I was asked to come and review an 18-year-old boy who was known to be an asthmatic, but like all brain tree lads, he decided that smoking was a good pastime as well. Um, and he presented with a classic story of a chest infection. He'd cough, yellow phlegm, he was feverish, He'd been using his inhaler all weekend, pretty much non-stop. And the A&E consultant gave me a ring and said, look, this guy's not responding to serial nebulizers, one of my bugbears, but that's another matter. Um, he was still able to talk to me. He was short, speaking in short staccato sentences, and he was shaking. You could see him physically shaking. He had the salbutamol shakes, and enough was enough in terms of nebulizers. So the chest x-ray that we saw, as you can see, is fairly... Um, straightforward, got the zapper, pretty hyperinflated lungs, no obvious signs of consolidation there, a pretty normal x-ray that you'd expect to see in a, a pretty bad asthmatic. Now, as is my want, I brought him up to the ICU, I stopped the aminophilin infusion, I stopped the cell butamol nebulizers, um, and hopefully you can see here when he came in, his pH was 7.18, his CO2 was 9.6. Um, in essence, he was reasonably easy to oxygenate, but his CO2 clearance was the problem. Stopped all the uh, beta 2 agonists, and because he was in an ITU, I knew I could intubate him. He was a nice and skinny lad. I gave him some ketamine, which seemed to work for a bit because he was just so overstimulated with beta 2 agonists, he really wasn't coping. Um, and you can see that actually his pH improved, his CO2 came down with a bit of ketamine, he did get some bronchodilatation. He'd already been given some hydrocortisone, and I was hoping that things would kick in with the steroids and he'd improve, but I'm, well, we'll see. Um, slightly busy slide and doesn't show uh, things too well, hopefully you can see, but I can point out, the, in essence, we got a couple of hours of improvement in terms of CO2 clearance, but once his CO2 started rising again and his pH started dropping, I thought, hang on, I'm not going to win here with non-invasive means. So we intubated him. And that's where my problems began. You can see that when he was intubated three or four hours down the line, his tidal volumes for a 70 kilo lad weren't too bad. I mean, he was getting tidal volumes globally recorded on our ventilator, 345 to 500 mils, which for a 70 kilo boy is perfectly within what you'd, uh, you'd ideally uh, want to ventilate someone. But you can see, well, I put it up here, post-intubation, we were just not ventilating him well at all. Despite cardiovascularly, he was okay. So this wasn't a perfusion issue of his lungs, this was pure bronchospasm. So I put the Palma Vista on, and you can see this is the, the band, the strap that's around the chest, and at this point, 
I decided that I was going to use Siva Fluorain to sedate him and also act as a bronchodilator. We use the Anaconda device, which is a very handy little thing that saves you getting a boils machine down from theatres um, to provide some bronchodilatation. So this is what I saw, and I'll show you. Put the Palma Vista device on, and on the, the right hand of the screen, you can see this is real time. This is what you get next to your bed space. So up here, this is with each breath. You can see inspiration and expiration. And in essence, the importance, the reason I'm showing you this slide is it shows you that um, you've got regional variations um, recorded on this device. And I really wanted the quadrants, but there we go. It doesn't matter. Um, you've got regions one, two, and three. And essentially, you've got pretty reasonable ventilation in all four quadrants. And where I found this useful is that it, it demonstrated to me that it's a bit like Linus in his comfort blanket. Your chest X-ray wasn't telling me any lies and that we were getting reasonable variation, uh, reasonable regional variation or ventilation and there was nothing I was missing. I wasn't missing a pneumothorax. I wasn't missing a collapsed lung. I didn't have to keep asking the radiologist back to the bed space to get that information. Now, once you've seen a few of these images, you can see that the, actually the expiratory phase is quite delayed. The lung is not exhaling as quickly as one would expect. And where, why was this useful? Well, in this case, this lad was clearly not going to manage with standard DGH ITU care and asked for an ECMO team to come from Papworth. They would duly put him on um, onto ECMO, and he actually improved despite a few problems with uh, the insertion of the femoral line. Where did it make a difference? Well, I think, as I say, it's, it's, it was my comfort blanket. It allowed in a patient that was extremely sick, with a pH of barely over seven, for me to have the confidence to say, I've reached the limit of what I can do. I can't ventilate this lad any better, and actually, I need another, I need someone else to come and help me. So the next case, 76-year-old um, woman. She recently had a, a stomach, her hiatus hernia, taken out of the left side of her chest. And you can see on the chest X-ray here, this is the X-ray that when she was discharged from hospital, a fairly unremarkable chest X-ray, I think you'd agree. Um, unfortunately, she presented back to the A&E, and you can see quite clearly that her stomach has popped back up into the left side of her chest. There's a fluid level there, and that's the top of the stomach there. So, not surprisingly, she was a bit short of breath. Now, somewhat surprising to me, and our, our gastroenterologist decided that this would be a good case to take to theatre and uh, endoscope. Beats me why, I, I won't go into that. But... Um, Clearly, with endoscopy, they inflated some air in. This lung didn't like that at all. She was essentially on one lung ventilation, and she promptly arrested. <coughs> Fortunately, because they'd done it in theatre, there was an anaesthetist about. They tubed the patient. She had return of circulation quite quickly. They asked the surgeons to come along, and they indeed um, found the perforation, but the rest of the stomach was viable. And you can see, once we CT'd her, that the air that they'd inflated, basically she collapsed the entire part of her left side of her lung. Most of the rest of the uh, thorax was filled with stomach. Um, and clearly she needed this draining and her chest re-expanding, or lung re-expanding. Sorry about the busy slide, but the things that I want to point out... Oh, where's the zapper gone? Okay. Um, you can see when she came in, she had a very high FI2, as you would expect. This woman had, in essence, an iatrogenic tension pneumothorax. Her effort, she was on one lung ventilation. She'd had lost her output. So everything was not tickety-boo. Her FI2 requirements were high initially, but they quickly reduced. And again, on the global measures that you get from your ventilator, your expired tidal volumes, we had reasonable tidal volumes. We were going from... 400, maybe 500 mils uh, per breath, 
which again for a 75 kilo woman is not exceptional. Go on. So as her FI2 came down, we decided that actually everything was good. She was coughing well, the secretions weren't a problem, her chest had re-expanded, you had air entry on the left. Um, and so we extubated her, as you might, might normally do. Unfortunately, she didn't do very well. She failed extubation very quickly, really didn't cope with non-invasive ventilation well, so we re-intubated her took the CT, and took her to CT. And you can see that her chest is re-expanded, the stomach's nowhere to be seen, that had already been fixated below the diaphragm again. And from that CT, yes, there's a bit of atelectasis, a bit of residual collapse at the base, but nothing that you would say on there that really would say this woman is not extubatable. From the chest x the, uh, chest x ray at the similar time, you can see she has some relative hyperexpansion on the right, relative decreased volumes on the left. You can see she's got a little pigtail drain for that effusion she had. But in essence, it's not. Again, the current or standard technology CT scans and chest x rays don't really suggest that this woman should be unextubatable. We tried again, we got her FI2 down after the first event. She clearly didn't like having the tube in. We run people with remifentanil most of the time with a bit of propofol. She was able, to, she was lucid, she was able to indicate that she didn't like this. She wanted that out. Um, and we gave her another go and we extubated her again when it seemed appropriate. She fails again. I spend probably an hour physically holding a water circuit onto her face, trying to increase the peep, trying to get her to breathe. She was moving her chest. She was attempting to breathe. Her respiratory drive was good, but just no, there was no movement of the, um, the bag. And she desaturates um, and eventually have to re-intubate her. Bronchoscoped her at the time, and you see that for a woman that's been intubated and suctioned for about a couple of weeks at this point, uh, this is the left side of her chest, which was the, the area that was the area of concern. There's a bit of granulation tissue there, but it, it's really, it was a clear, a clear lung. There were no plugs, there was no secretions. This was just, didn't make sense, did not make sense. So with standard ventilation, you can see that this was, I think at the time, she had a peep of uh, nine, with a pressure support of 12 above this. This is the right side of her chest, and this is the left over here. You can see that there is air entry over onto the, um, the left side of her chest with standard ventilation up here. So everything's working when you're giving her high pressure, but once you move things along and you try and ventilate her uh, airway uh, sort of pressure supports of five on five, so sort of low pressure support, lowish peeps that you might try before you're going to extubate someone and, and see how they're going to cope, you can see that suddenly there's nothing going on on the left. She is purely ventilating the right side of her chest and she was essentially, there was nothing going on. And when we bronchoscoped, bronchoscoped her with low peeps, you could see that the, the chest, every time she took a breath in, the small bronchioles on the, on the left side that you could see were just collapsing. There was nothing going on at all. And the, this is just a, a graph that shows the tidal volumes over time, and these arrows are times where we've reduced the pressure support and peep, and you can see the tidal volumes are disappearing into nothingness you've got tidal volumes of 150 and 50 mils. So she's barely ventilating her dead space, let alone the alveoli. And not surprisingly, she um, didn't oxygenate very well at these points. So there's static images on the left of what you can see in the dynamic images. Unfortunately for this woman, this was a non-survivable injury. Um, it was quite apparent over 
she was with us for 59 days. We repeatedly tried to get this woman off the ventilator. Her lungs were clear. She just had bronchomalacia on the left side. And as soon as she tried to breathe, there was nothing going on. She was just shifting air in her dead space. Um, and we were able to wake her up on, enough on, on Remy Fentanyl, discuss with her, and she actually didn't want any long-term ventilation. She decided enough was enough. 59 days with us was uh, more than enough. Um, so where did it, how did it help us? Well, as you can see, it gives us real-time information or real, real-life information at the bed space and tells you what's going on with the lungs. The tidal volumes that we were recording would indicate that everything was OK. She wasn't on huge amounts of pressure support. She should, by conventional terms, be extubatable. But it showed you in a real dynamic image why this woman was not ventilating. Um, and highlighted to me that chest x-rays, CT scans are snapshots of that patient. And you can't predict what's going to happen with different ventilator settings. Finally, last case, a little slightly happier story. We actually got someone to survive. Um, 84-year-old man presents to A&E with backache. GP had tr treated him with diazepam, assuming this was musculoskeletal. He was a known arteriopath, had a recent MI, had a poor myocardium, known to have emphysema, and was pretty poor exercise tolerance, to be honest. Um, someone with that sort of exercise limitation on current sort of uh, scores of frailty, you might consider whether you would take him, you certainly wouldn't take him as an elective, but he presented as an emergency. Because he didn't have backache, he had an aortic aneurysm. Um, fortunately for him, it hadn't ruptured at this point, but it was big enough that it was about to. So he ended up having an operation, had an aorta by aneurysmal graft. Um, and luckily for him, the surgeons took out his spleen when they were going in in their zeal um, and ended up losing five litres, which is pretty, pretty high loss for what is in essence a, an, a, an elective aortic aneurysm repair. For some reason, again, unknown to myself, but the anaesthetist tried to extubate him and he promptly failed in, in recovery. Not surprisingly, I think he was pretty cold, shut down, base later Lexus, 84, emphysema. I think it was pretty optimistic to try and extubate him and he ended up coming to us. But you can see from the CT scan, just a slice through his chest, despite that bad respiratory history, his lung fields were unremarkable. And I think we've all been here with uh, emergency aneurysms and abdominal cases where a patient comes down from theatre, their FI2 requirements are very high, it was high FI2s. We had pretty reasonable tidal volumes, but he had poor oxygenation. He had a poor to moderate cough, and this is a day-by-day -day view. And at day four, having already failed once in theatre or up in recovery, he was a skin and bone man, poor cardiac history, poor respiratory history. We electively intubate, uh, did a perk trachea on him day four. Now, the chest x-ray shows you what you'd probably predict. Fluid at the bases, he's had a lot of fluid out, he's had a lot of fluid in, he's had a big inflammatory response. You can imagine the guy sitting in bed, he's this um, Michelin man with fluid, there's no muscle on him, and he's got basal pleural a basal atelectasis and pleural effusions, and you can see this on a, a CT scan as well. But convention, and I'm an old dinosaur, I would say, you would think that ventilation is going to go to this bit, aren't you? However, when we put the Pulmer Vista on, it gave me a different story. So with standard ventilation, you can see that air is predominantly going to the, the ventral regions, or sorry, the dorsal regions, not anteriorly where you'd expect it. You'd expect all the ventilation to be going up to the apices, which is lying flat in the front of the chest. But actually, the Pulmo Vista showed that we were ventilating his posterior segments of his lung. So completely counterintuitive to what you'd expect from someone with this sort of history. So what do you do? 
Well, if you've got a Puma Vista, you can do this. So pretty much the same strategies as you might expect for someone that's not working well. You turn the peep up, you, you do, in old fashioned terms, you'd get a water circuit and you'd get the nurse and she'd squeeze like bilio and you wouldn't measure the pressures and everyone would be happy as long as the blood pressure's okay. Um, but now we do this through the ventilator, I'll turn the peep up to 15, 20, and have the pressure support 20 above that as well. So really quite high pressures. I come from an era where 10 of PEEP was considered a bit scary. Um, I know the North Americans are much more comfortable with higher PEEPs, but I don't think in this country we traditionally use PEEP as much as other places around the world. And you can see with, with these higher ventilation strat or higher pressure strategies, you can see that we're now getting ventilation to the, the front of his chest, which wasn't the case before. So by doing this, what it's allowed us to do is actually recruit areas of the lung and improve the sputum clearance and get him off the ventilator. Yes, it took a long time. He had background problems, but it... 29 days in ICU, 10 days in ICU, he actually got home, which I, you can't prove it, but I think with our standard strategies of assuming that the tidal volumes are okay and his chest seemed to be moving bilaterally, we were not ventilating this guy effectively. And by using this technology, it just gave you that understanding of what was really going on in his lungs and allowed us to change our strategies and see the effect of what our ventilation changes um, made in him. So what did, what did we learn? Well, there clearly is a disconnect with what you see on a chest x-ray and on a CT scan with what's happening dynamically in the patient. Um, and it fundamentally changed how we dealt with this patient. It encouraged us to use these lung, lung recruitment strategies and now the nurses call it the PEEP of 12 machine. Um, it is, it has really encouraged us to increase the amount of PEEP that we give to patients. Um, we are much more comfortable now as a unit, I think, in giving much higher PEEPs than we ever used to. It used to be standard set up, five of PEEP, that's good for everyone. And that clearly isn't the case, not for everyone. So where do I see it as being a real benefit? Well, like I say, the tidal volumes don't necessarily show you, well, they clearly don't show you where the lung is being ventilated. And this piece of technology allows you to see that. Chest X-rays and CTs are static images. They don't show you where the ventilation is going. Um, it is, as it says, this is a adjunct. It is not a replacement for all the other bits and pieces. And yes, you can have very good figures and outcome figures without an EIT, but it really, once you've had it, you don't want to lose it, trust me. Um, it really does give you that sense that what you're doing, your adjustments, you can see what happens in real time, and if it's horribly wrong, well, you can stop it. You don't have to wait 20 minutes, half an hour for the next gas. You can see it in real time. It allows us to work out in terms of what's going on in the lung, what optimal peep, optimal peep is. And as I say, we've, we've gone up with what we would standardly use. Um, it can tell you other information. It can tell you whether you've got pleural effusions, other areas of collapse, and so hence reduce your need for serial um, radiology. And as I say, it's real time, um, and there's no, no replacement for it. That's us. Little star, um, so I'd be very happy if anyone's interested. I'd take questions. If anyone wanted to come and see it in action, we'll show you.